Hello everyone, I'm Gabriel Bronner. I'm with SGI. Uh, this is going to be a very fast tutorial. In 15 minutes, you're going to leave here knowing how to innovate in your company. So, high hopes for the next 15 minutes. But at least it'll motivate you to stay here before the break. Um, so I was uh, at SGI before. I was at Cray 91, uh, and then that became part of SGI 96. I work on operating systems. We heard Unicos this week. That was me at the time. Unicos MK for the T3. That was what I worked on the design of. Um, then was part of SGI. Then I left HPC for a few years to go figure out what's going on in the rest of the world. I went to Microsoft of all evils. I was there for four years. Uh, learned a lot on that side. But then I went to Ericsson, and for four years I was head of innovation, figuring out how to make 6,000 people across the world more innovative. After doing that for four years, I said, I want to go back to a place where I can apply what I know about software and what I know about uh, HPC. And I rejoined SGI last year. So I've been back a year applying the methods of innovation at SGI. So what I'm going to try to do here is not the typical vendor talk. I'm not going to tell you about the roadmaps. I'm going to tell you what is this method of innovation? What did I come up with or, or we came up with after these four years at Ericsson on how to achieve consistent innovation? Hopefully you learned something you can take and use yourselves. Um, so first, I call this user-centered innovation. And why is that? I'll give you my definition of innovation is a fresh idea that creates value. Uh, you may have seen many definitions of innovation. I like this one. I like the idea that is, is new, but it also creates value, creates value to the customer, creates value to the end user. So what I'm going to tell you is the method that, that we're using that I sort of worked at Ericsson and now at SGI that starts from the user, understand their needs, and develop innovation from that. It's a process that starts at the beginning with going and talking to customers. So what do we do at the front end of any project? We go talk to customers. How many? 10 to 20. It's not like market research. It's not 500 or 1,000. It's 10 to 20, but deeply. You try to understand their problems. As you talk to a customer, you understand this is the pain they have. And out of that, you uncover these unarticulated needs. Usually, I live through. In the Cray days, people tell me, I need checkpoint restart, I need accounting, I need whatever. But at the end, was that what people really needed in that list of features? No, you need to understand what are their challenges, what keeps them up at night, what is the problem they're trying to solve. That will give you the opportunity to one level up from the feature list, innovate. So you want to uncover these unarticulated customer needs, and you want to do it in a consistent way, because one of the things that happens at every company, a VP talks to a customer, he comes back the following day and says, what we need to do is X. Well, that's a problem, too. You don't want to take one customer input and turn it into that. So the second step is we synthesize the input from these 10 to 20 customers and identify opportunity areas, right problems to solve, and that's where the process starts. Once we got the good problem to solve, that's, to me, that's 80% of the battle. I know the problem to solve. I can give it to the engineers. The engineers are great at solving problems. But if they don't start from this point, what's the user need? They may be solving some other kind of problem. So it starts there, continues here. And then you brainstorm on possible ideas. And you want to get many ideas. And we even have rules for brainstorming. Like, for example, um, defer judgment is, is, is a good rule of brainstorming. As we're coming up with ideas, what happens in every company I've seen is somebody says, we've done that before, or we'll never get to do that. And that sort of kills the innovation. You want to allow all of these ideas to come up. And as the ideas come up, you make lists of ideas, and you're going to select later. You don't kill ideas that come up. You just select later. Once you select ideas, what do you do? You fast prototype these ideas as quickly as you can. You try to put it together in some form so you can share with customers and, and test them. And with that, you're going to learn. You're going to build something to learn. You're not building something to ship. You build something to learn in the process. Because as you build something, you're going to stop the discussion. You're going to get real feedback. And you're going to see how you need to course correct. And as you iterate on this, you evolve. And that's what influences the roadmap. This is a method that the output is innovation. Most companies have processes for execution, but not a process that the output is innovation. So this is the process we follow. So let me give you a sense of the things we've done. We talked to some people in this room and some people not in this room at the front end uh, you know, last summer. And we asked them, what are your challenges? And after we talked to all these people, we came back and put them all on the wall. Once we put them on the wall, it looked kind of like this. We could post it notes from each of the customers with quotes. You know, quotes are great. 
instead of saying, um, you know, one of the quotes in system management, instead of saying people need this or that, that's not very, uh, doesn't reach you very much, but somebody tell you, we only have two people here and we need to manage this big center. We hear that all over, right? Now you start feeling for these people, the guy who told you only two here with this big center to manage. So as the people go back and design features, they thinking, will this work for these two guys or will not work for these two guys? So you start developing empathy for these people. So quotes are good. It's almost like 33% of the people do something, doesn't matter, but you hit a personal story that reaches you. You want the 20 personal stories here. So we do this. So how, how does it look like? Let's pick on one. Well, it looks like something like, you know, biggest growth is in users that have not used HPC before. Interesting. Um, we, people run Windows, people want to run Windows because they run things at their desktop and they want to run it, you know, submit it and run it for a week perhaps or run it with large memory or things like that. You know, and, and we start hearing these little things from different customers and we start collecting many of these across the wall. So then themes emerge. Once you put all these, all these things on the wall, you start taking these quotes and categorizing them in, in columns and saying, what are the key things we heard? And I'll share with you, what are the things we heard? We heard these things from our customers. You know, UV is our large memory system, and we have both kinds, large, big SMP systems and clusters. And you know, customers will say, we want to integrate both because we're not one way or the other. We want to use both at the same time. That'd be one thing. Another one would be, we want to enable the non-traditional HPC users. We hear that from different types of customers. We hear that in the conference too. Um, we heard from people, enable more efficient workflows. If you talk to the manufacturing people, it's all about how long it takes them to do one, one run. If it takes them two weeks and you can reduce that, that's gold for them because they can get a product out sooner, etc. So why is it important to come up with opportunity areas like this? Because now you can turn this into problems. What are the problems? Well, you can perhaps just take the, any of this into a problem and say, how might we better integrate UV and clusters? How might we enable non-traditional HPC users? And that becomes the first part of the second phase. And the next phase is a brainstorming session. In a brainstorming session, you bring that up as a question. Why, how might we? Because that's inclusive, that's positive. You say, why don't you? You're gonna say, hey, wait a second, I'm gonna become defensive. So there's a lot in the language here. So how might we better enable non-traditional HPC users? And then we go and come up with a bunch of ideas. And then we select one. We use voting dots. These are simulated voting dots. We're given to people, select ideas. And then we said, Windows support. We have our big UV system, it runs Linux. You, you have to know Linux. You have to write parallel programming. But if you offer Windows support, you can run things that you run on your desktop. Okay, after we select that idea, what do we do? We do a first prototype. How does a first prototype look like? It looks like a picture or a PowerPoint presentation. I told the guy thinking about the idea, you have 30 minutes to put together your idea on something, like a PowerPoint presentation or a, you know, a poster or something like that. And this was his kind of first picture. Okay, I'm gonna be at my desktop, but I'm gonna be running Windows on this big system, and I send visualization back, and now we floated that idea among a few people. And we're gonna run this inside a VM here, inside Linux, inside a VM, we're gonna run Windows. And people go, okay, good, bad, not bad. In 30 minutes, you put something together. In a few hours, you have feedback. And now you go and do the second prototype. How was the second prototype? I went to the lunch area and talked to the people having lunch there. And I said, we came up with this idea to put Windows inside a VM on the UV system. We can do that. And they started planning a huge project. They said, no, 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 just quick. How can you do it? And they said, well, we can just try it. Exactly, that's the second prototype. So it was Tuesday at lunchtime. Wednesday at four o'clock, I got a call from these guys in their 20s, by the way, they were energetic and quick. No, no worries about failing. And four o'clock, Wednesday, come, can you come to our office? Yeah, and they showed me Windows running inside a VM in, in UV, slow, ugly, and everything. But I said, exactly, that's what I wanted. It, it runs, okay, let's figure out why is it ugly and slow. Then you do a second iteration, then you do a third iteration. And like that, we ended up Running Windows, so the second prototype were running Windows inside a VM from my desktop, and two weeks later, I was able to run Windows as a demo 
from my desktop anywhere in the world connecting back to the office. It was everything running in the office, Windows Server, terabyte of memory, whatever you wanted, as many CPUs as you wanted, but it's a question of iterating quickly. And now it's part of the product. So if you get the UV, you can get Windows as an option running there. The objective started as these users that don't know parallel programming, don't know Linux, and they want to connect and use this. But the process is, is the interesting thing. Because when I arrived at the company, they told me, we've been discussing for two years whether we put Windows or not Windows. The discussion ended when we did this in weeks. And the interesting point for me is you build something quick, you test it, you get feedback, you evolve, you move on. So that was one of the things we did. Another one that was kind of similar, uh, put Flash on this same UV system. Somebody came up with the idea of using the new Intel cards, NVMe, borrow 12 cards, put it in the box, so great scaling, okay? Then we go talk to Intel about getting 64 cards. We put 64 cards in, in a matter of weeks, and we start seeing huge numbers of I.O., 30 million IOPS, 200 gigabytes per second, just by putting the cards there. That became now a project. It'll be part of the product. So the point I'm trying to make is go try something, see the results, evolve it. I'm not going to bore you with details, but for system management, we did the same thing. At the front end, we went and talked to people about their needs. I told you about the two guys. Like that, we had list of opportunities. Now, the team is designing for that, for the opportunities that we heard from these customers. Last, I'm going to tell you something a bit different than what I normally do, but it seems more like what you guys do because I've been listening to that. Uh, we saw on The Economist in October, like October 27, <coughs> Why don't you use cell phone position and data to stop or curb the spread of Ebola? And the point was, if you know where people are, and you know where they've been, and you know who they've been with, well, if somebody's infected, you can backtrack where they've been, who they've been in contact with, and suddenly go notify those people to get checked. So what we did is we talked to um, the GIS Federal, who does mapping. We, they said, we do mapping, but we know nothing about Ebola. We went to the University of Minnesota. Dr. Andres Perez is an epidemiologist. That's what he did in, I think, in San Diego, and now he's in Minnesota. And he worked with us. So the three groups worked together for two weeks, put something together very quickly. We showed it, oh, this is what we want. This isn't what we want. It was just like a drawing. I agree on that. Then we did the second version, and in two weeks, we had this running. That is what we actually showed at supercomputing in our booth running on this UV system. So what I'll do here is I'll run this video, which is kind of the, the demo of this running. And what this does effectively is in a map, imagine you have in memory all the data from cell phone positioning from potentially all the people in the region or whatever you want. And now you're able to go and say, First here, there's a map, and this is a test data from two hours north of here, I think it's Fredericksburg, uh, Virginia, Fredericksburg, Virginia. And these are people's movements in a map. And then let's say you're gonna say, this person is infected, this cell phone. Here is a unique identifier. Now the person in red has been infected with Ebola. But now they've been in touch with all these other people and you have the in-memory database with that. And now you know that all these people in yellow were in contact with the person in red. So you can go notify them. You can get the list of people and notify them about that. So that's a quick video, which is just real time from, from what's going there. Potentially, the use cases are about um, notifying the people, being able to see where people are moving, and be prepared for the potential spread. If you're more interested in this, I wrote a little article in this blog, SEI.com, Ebola and Big Data with dashes, and it points to the video also. So that's about it for 15 minutes on innovation. Um, my final comments are, this is a structured way to innovate. Most places don't have a structured way to innovate. It's rooted on customer needs. It promotes this cross-group collaboration. You bring people from different areas to solve problems and work together. It breaks the silos. It does encourage fast prototyping and iterating. And one thing that I, I, should, I should really play up, which is its sanction. When I did this initiative at Ericsson, when I did it at Microsoft, it's legal to innovate. Most places, you have to hide to innovate because you have to hide from your boss and there's no place to innovate. Here it's legal. 
So now people are encouraged to innovate. There's a process, there's a method. You avoid these discussions. We've done this before. Well, that's not part of the discussion now. We're just coming up with ideas. We'll select later. Having a process allow you to move things forward. If you want to reach me, this is my email. I put it just on the slide, gbronner at sgi.com. Hope this was useful for you. Uh, it's been good for me to listen to all of you, and I wanted to share a bit of what I know that is in the intersection of HPC, innovation, etc. Thanks, everyone.